Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for joining. I really appreciate you all coming so that we can help teach of all, all of our students about some of the ways that they could explore intellectual property practice. We have a huge range of folks from um, patents to trademarks, in-house experience, law firms, um, from big to small. And so I think this will be a really great panel for you. Thank you guys so much. Um, we have... Um, we have uh, Rita Klein from Renner Auto. We have Bonnie Smith from Rockwell Automation, uh, Susan Gerber from Jones Day. And thank you to Jones Day for sponsoring the lunch that we're going to have afterwards. So thank you very much. And then we have um, Sal uh, Sidoti uh, from Sidoti and Trillis. So before we jump in, I would love to have each of you maybe give a self-introduction to say a little bit about what you're doing in your current role so that the students know uh, what kind of questions to ask you about. Maybe we can start with Bonnie. Hi, I'm Bonnie Smith. Um, I am currently in my 10th year of practice. I have a bachelor's in materials science engineering from the University of Michigan. Sorry, um, I have a JD from Wayne State in Detroit, and I spent eight years in private practice, and I've been in-house for two years now. Um, in my current role, I am one of three IP attorneys for the company, and I support all IP issues for one of Rockwell Automation's business segments. So I'm focused in uh, drives, power control business, and safety devices. Hi, I'm Rita Klein. Um, I am a trademark attorney. Um, I went to, uh, got my bachelor's degree from John Carroll University in chemistry, and then um, went to law school, um, decided I didn't want to be in um, the lab, working in the lab. So uh, I heard about this thing called a patent lawyer and um, uh, tried uh, to, um, Get, get some more information in that uh, field. Um, went to law school here, actually. I'm an alma mater of uh, Cleveland um, Marshall Law School. Um, and I've been practicing for 23 years. Um, the first five was as a patent attorney. And then I uh, switched over to um, trademark law and practice that exclusively now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sal Sidoti. Um, I graduated from Hiram College in 92 with a degree in biology and a minor in chemistry. I spent a hot minute in grad school at Case in biochemistry and then decided to come to law school. I'm also a graduate of Cleveland State University Law School in 1999. I started practicing as a patent agent in 1997 when I was still in law school with a boutique in Akron, the Renner Kenner firm, and transitioned into an associate attorney at that firm upon graduation and passing the bar in 99. Um, stayed at that firm until 03, and a couple of us uh, left the firm, separated from them, and started Curatol and Sedoti in October of 2003. So it's been over 20 years now. And I primarily practice uh, patent preparation and prosecution. Uh, IP opinion work and IP contracts or agreements, and mainly in the chemical and biotech biochem areas. Hi, I'm Sue Gerber. Um, and my story is kind of long because I didn't do anything like a normal person does. Um, I graduated from high school actually in 1983, and I had the brilliant idea that I was going to be a secretary my whole life. So I got an associate's degree from the University of Akron, and I was working in human resources and still taking some classes at night because I thought I wanted a bachelor's degree, but I didn't know what in. So I was kind of a general business major floundering along. And in the human resources department, I worked in the grievance department with various personnel issues and the like. And I said, hey, I think law school would be cool. Um, so I set the goal that was in 1986, um, I'm sorry, 89, that I wanted to go to law school, but I still had a lot of undergrad work to do. And so I got the opportunity to go to Jones Day in 1988 and work as a secretary. And I was assigned to their intellectual property department. So I changed my major and I um, became, a, I got my bachelor's in from the University of Akron as well in natural science. 
and then went to Akron's Law School. Um, in the meantime, I felt like I was getting older and older and older. So I had two children while I was in school. I started law school with a three-year-old and a five-month-old. I don't recommend that path to anybody, um, but I was had the opportunity to then go back to Jones Day as a new summer associate and then a new associate. Um, I ran out for a year to go clerk for the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals for the Honorable Alice Batchelder. And then I started with my class full-time uh, in 2020, I'm sorry, 2001. So um, I've been now, uh, this year will be 25 years out of law school. I'm a patent litigator. Um, I do all kinds of patent related litigation and a lot of collateral kinds of litigation, discovery um, issues. Um, we do a lot of cross border litigation. So often I get called on to do discovery actions here in the States to get evidence that we can then use in patent cases overseas. Great. So a lot of you guys have pretty diverse um, educational backgrounds. We have a few uh, chemistry folks, but uh, some that didn't get uh, this sort of hard science degree. I suppose natural sciences, did that make you eligible for the patent bar exam? Yeah, I would be eligible to sit. I never sat for it. And then I got to a point after some point of time and I was like, forget it. <laughs> it wasn't worth the time. But um, my degree has mostly chemistry, um, but some physics and polymers and math. So it sounds like you might not need a hard science background to be able to practice IP. Would you guys agree with that? And is that true in your particular area of practice or not? I imagine for, for Sal, that might not be the case, but I'd be curious for your thoughts. Do you need a particular educational background to practice IP? Um, well, in the trademark area, you do not. Um, in order to practice before the USPTO on trademark matters, you can be any kind of an attorney um, with without uh, a hard science background. Um, but that is not the case for uh, patent prosecution and practicing before the United States Patent and Trademark Office on patent applications. And I will let the others um, speak more toward that. As far as IP litigation, you can do IP litigation without a hard science background. I would say it helps you to have a hard science background um, to uh, help with like claim construction and to understand all the concepts um, regarding what is a claim, what's the structure of the claim and how you can um, pick it apart, define it, enforce it, what you can enforce, how you can attack validity, et cetera. So uh, copyright law as well, you don't need to have a hard science um, background degree. So I'd agree with everything that Rita said, and I'd add a couple of other points. Um, it really depends on what the subject matter you're litigating as to how important, and even in the patent context, I don't think that a hard sciences degree is crucial as long as the technology is not super complicated. So a good chunk of my early part of my career, we did a lot of um, consumer products litigation. Um, and there was also at the time, um, there was a whole bunch of issues about false marking. And so we litigated all of that. And None of, you know, like, for example, um, I litigated the patents on the Crest white strips. And there's a little chemistry involved there, but it's basically a hydrogen peroxide gel, uh, you know, on a piece of plastic. So, you know, I used to call it schmutz on a strip, you know, so you don't need a whole, whole lot of, of high tech um, background in order to do that kind of litigation. But certainly, if you're going to be litigating pharmaceutical patents or something like that, you really need to know the the chemistry or the you know whatever the that subject matter is. And um, I think also if you're going to litigate IPRs, I think you also have to be registered. Or like I've I've worked on some, but I can't sign them because I'm not registered. So um, I can assist the team, but I'm not able to take any kind of a lead role on those cases. So for IPRs, for those that are curious, that's a uh an action that happens at the patent office that's deciding whether to cancel a patent that's been issued. So you can render a patent invalid in court, or you could have this proceeding at the patent office called inter partes review or IPR. And so those um, proceedings need to be led by an attorney that's registered before the patent bar. Um, but many of the people that assist the team are the litigators from maybe the corresponding district court case that might not have um, patent bar eligibility or might not have hard science backgrounds. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would say that 
I've seen our practice changing pretty dramatically on the litigation side where um, the, the those patent office proceedings, very, very often a defendant will immediately upon being sued, they'll file at the patent office and often it's not a not a for sure but often they'll get a stay of the district court litigation and um then then the case proceeds and they have so many aspects in those PTAP proceedings that you do need litigators cuz it's different but there's a lot of the same skill set so you see that overlap and i think we're going to see even more of it you know we see the numbers of the district courts dropping cases filed and certainly substantial numbers get filed with patent office Bonnie, have you felt like a science background has been necessary for your role? Yeah, so I think for an in-house role, it depends on the company and the role at the company. So Rockwell Automation, we are very tech technology heavy. Um, the technology is somewhat complex in electrical software. And um, so I do think having an engineering background has helped in that role. Everyone else on my team does have an engineering background, um, but we all are very focused on patents for the company. Um, other companies, I, I think of like Walmart, they have a really big uh, trademark portfolio. So if you were to go work for a company like that, um, a softer background would probably be okay if you're focused on trademarks. But um, in my day to day, when I'm talking to inventors and business people, um, you kind of have to understand the technology. So I do think having the harder background does does help in, in my role. And there's probably many different uh, lawyers throughout the company. And I suppose not, although the ones on your team have that background, not everybody in the in-house counsel office is going to have a science background, but they might still need to know something about IP. Yeah. So we have commercial attorneys. Um, they don't have technical background, but they, um, they get to do a lot of really interesting things. I never knew about um, being a commercial attorney. We actually had an IP attorney from my team who went to go be a commercial attorney. Um, so that he kind of started with the heavy science background, but then went on the commercial side. Um, we have contracts attorneys that don't have hard engineering backgrounds, um, but I I really love IP. And um, I feel like because I have that, that technical background, it makes me, only I can do what I do, where I could go and do what the commercial attorneys do or go and do what the contracts attorneys do, but none of them could come and do what I do. So I, it's, it's a, an asset, I think. Sal, did you have any additional thoughts on, I, I imagine for patent prosecution, that's going to be an essential thing. You're right on that point. Um, you couldn't do what I do on a daily basis without a technical degree. And I look at the, there's like four buckets of technical degrees, large buckets. One is like chemical. So many people have a degree in chemistry or chemical engineering, and they practice in the areas of, of chemical patents. And then there's mechanical patents, and most of those people have mechanical engineering degrees. And then there's electrical and software patents, and people in electrical in software, they're generally uh, software uh, engineers, computer science majors, electrical engineers. And then the fourth bucket may be biotechnology, where people have a degree in biology or an advanced degree in some sort of biotech. And a lot of like a lot of the biotech companies, they're looking for patent attorneys that do have PhDs in biochemistry or microbiology or immunology because their technology is so specific. They want someone that can speak their speak out of the gate and understand those really hard concepts, but then also understand the law and how to best protect those those inventions. Great. So many of you guys have. Um really exciting day-to-days and I'd love you guys to tell the students what what does a day-to-day -day work look like for you what do you enjoy most about it and what about your specific area of practice or location of practice do you really love we'll start with Bonnie yeah, so um, one of the things I like most about being in-house counsel now moving from private practice is my day to day is different every day and it's necessitated by the business needs that I for the groups that I support. So one day I may be working on if we're trying to acquire a company, I may be looking at their IP portfolio, make sure that they own the rights in the technology that we want to acquire. Um, the next day may be doing an invention harvesting session with 
my business groups to um, look at future product development, what we can do. Um, the next day, somebody may come to me with an NDA issue where they disclose something outside of an NDA, which is you know problematic. But um, so every day is is different, and when you're handling all the IP issues for uh, one of the segments, you kind of have to roll with whatever your business group asks because that's your your client, as opposed to uh, in private practice where you have a lot of different clients that you write patent applications for or do patent prosecution. Um, I would say that day-to-day uh, -to -day for me um, is very busy. <laughs> um, I handle a very large portfolio of um, matters for all sorts of diverse kinds of clients, foreign clients, domestic clients, all different types of clients, all different subject matter areas. So the businesses are very, very different. Um, and being a trademark attorney, you know, I I get exposed to different um, uh, industry areas as well, um, and learning about new products and talking with, um, working closely with the marketing uh, teams of those companies and, um, you know, handling that large docket, it is, uh, I thrive under that kind of, um, that kind of uh, uh, situation. So, so yes, there are a, a large number of matters, lots of deadlines. Um, my practice is deadline based. Um, I think every, every attorney has deadline based um, practice to a certain extent. Um, but when you're in prosecution and trying to get trademarks um, registered, then there's associated deadlines that you have to meet. Um, and in a lot of cases, you can't get extensions. So you have to be really good at um, determining what needs to get done for a particular matter ahead of that deadline. Staying ahead of your deadlines is critical in my um, in my practice. But it's it's exhilarating, and um, I have a great team that supports me. So like Rita, I feel I could work 24-7, 365 and still not be done with what I need to get done with. I suppose if you're in private practice of law, that's a good thing because you're always busy and it means your clients trust you and they keep coming back to you. Um, I think there's two points about my particular practice and day that I find uh, that is important to me and gives me um, some level of satisfaction is the diversity of the different matters that I handle for the clients and the diversity of the technologies from the different clients. So, for example, one day I might be writing a patent application and it could be something where you turn your computer on and it's a blank screen. There's nothing there. I have to create something like an artist. And I'm trying to create this intellectual property, right, that's going to help my clients. It's going to help their business grow. Other days I might be working on uh, a rejection from a patent office where the patent examiner says, you stink, get out of here, you don't have anything. But it's our job then to say, well, you really have it wrong. We're patentable and these are the reasons why. And that takes researching the uh, the references that a, an examiner would cite against you, doing legal research to come up with your best legal and technical arguments, packaging that and getting it back to the patent office for their consideration. I could be working on IP agreements, um, and there's a whole host of them. There are confidentiality agreements when people want to get together and talk about something, but they don't want the other party to disclose it. There's research agreements, joint development agreements, uh, IPR, um, excuse me, not IPR, but uh, intellectual property right assignments, licenses, asset purchase agreements, which Bonnie probably looks at a lot on behalf of her client. Or I could be doing opinion work. Another bucket of my uh, professional schedule is doing opinions for clients. Um, whether a patent is infringed by their competitors, whether a uh, product that they may be selling or would want to sell infringes anyone's patent, whether that new invention that they came up with is patentable. So uh, it's the diversity of the different matters that I enjoy, and it's also the diversity of the, the subject matter, the technologies. One day I could be working on industrial insulation, 
The next day I might be working on a vaccine. The next day I might be working on a perfume composition. It just depends uh, on the client and uh, the workflow. And with Rita, everything in the patent world, like the trademarks is date driven. You have to comply with dates. And if you don't comply with the dates, you could lose the intellectual property right, which is not good for you or your law firm. And so I probably look at my ceiling fan sometimes at night, spinning around thinking about docketing dates and making sure all dates uh, are met. But a important part of the actual date at the patent and trademark office or in court is your client's business deadline. They have considerations that are separate and distinct from what the, the due date at the patent and trademark office is. Maybe they want to launch a product. Maybe they have a big business meeting. Maybe they're um, going, to the, going to a lender to get funds to buy some equipment or build a new facility. So you have to be cognizant of, of those dates as well, because part of your job as an attorney is not just getting the legal work done timely, uh, you know, timely, efficiently, uh, correctly at a high level, but also managing the client relationship. So they feel that you are treating them right and fairly and you're on top of their work. So I can't underscore that enough. I feel like as an attorney, client service is our number one priority. And uh, in the litigation side, you know, yes, deadlines, 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 but the, um, you know, it's driven by the court schedule. So if you think back to your Civ Pro course, everything is, you know, all the things that you learn in Civ Pro from the filing of the complaint to going through discovery to ultimately preparing the case and getting it ready for trial and trying it. Um, those, all of those things happen, but with the overlay of the patents on top of it. So you'll have extra deadlines for um, say infringement contentions or invalidity contentions. Um, you've got an extra set of briefing for um, the claim construction phase, which in most courts anymore, that's done early in the process so that when you start to engage your experts and start to get your expert opinions together, you know what the court's kind of meaning the court's gonna apply to your patents, um, which is a huge benefit if you roll back the clock 25 plus years ago, even before Mark, the Markman decision was even decided, um, often they'd be doing claim construction. Well, sometimes they'd let the jury do it. So that was a treat. Um, <laughs> but uh, the claim construction could often happen in the trial, during the trial, even after the trial. And so it was very confusing. So I think um, we've heard themes about diversity. You never know what today's going to hold. And I would definitely underscore that for my practice. You know, that's certainly driven by the schedule. And usually I only have a couple of three matters that are in active litigation at any given time. So I don't have the day to day. It's going to be this subject matter, this subject matter. Usually it's more for the next couple of three years. I might be, you know, involved in um, you know, jump starter batteries or um, consumer products or something like that. And so you really get immersed in one particular technology within the, the framework of a litigation framework. And you do a lot of work at the ITC as well. The USITC is, um, or maybe you can tell a little bit about it and how it might be a little bit different from practicing in district courts. Sure. So um, the International Trade Commission is an agency court that allows patent owners to come in and get a limited remedy in that you can't get money damages at the ITC. You can only get an exclusionary remedy if you are able to prove a violation of the intellectual property laws at issue have occurred. And if you can win that exclusionary remedy, then any infringing imports are stopped at the border. Um, and so it's a really, really powerful remedy. Um, if you compare it to district court litigation, it could take many, many years to get through to an actual get a, a remedy. Now, at district court, you can get an injunction, which potentially could stop the infringer from making, selling, using the, the patented or trademarked technology, whatever that may be. Um, but at the International Trade Commission, it's very compressed. It, there's a target date of somewhere between 16 and 18 months. So from filing the complaint until the end of the case, you do it, you know, multiple years worth of litigation in a very, very short period of time. You do an evidentiary hearing, not a jury trial. Um, and at, at that evidentiary hearing, you put all of your evidence in, in front of an administrative law judge who then decides whether or not a violation of the intellectual property right has occurred. 
Yeah, so this is a, you can be a different practice experience if you're at a firm that specializes in ITC work um, like Jones Day. Um, they do a lot of work both um, at the ITC and in district courts. Um, but if you're working predominantly in district courts, you might have um, more cases at a time that are spread out across multiple years. So I think um, I've done work on both ITC and district court cases. And at the times that I was focused on district courts, I might have something like five to six uh, cases at a time, but those cases were taking five to seven years to resolution instead of two to three years to resolution. And it was a little bit of a slower pace. So it just uh, it depends which area you're interested in. If you really like um, litigation and that experience of being in the courtroom, ITC can be a good uh, process for that. So I'm curious with many students have a choice of doing perhaps general litigation or uh, tort litigation or something like that instead, or perhaps of working in-house in a corporate capacity. Um, why would why would you say that they should explore intellectual property instead of going down maybe a general litigation or general corporate route? Because it's really fun. <laughs> I mean, that sounds silly, but it really is exciting work. And it's specialized. I think you know, Bonnie made the point is we all could litigate general litigation matters, but general litigators can't necessarily do what we do. And I think that there's some a significant commercial value um, to having that extra skill. So I think there's a, a big benefit there. And um, it's, it's, I just find it fascinating to really learn behind the scenes how things work. You know, it was fascinating to meet the inventors of the products I see on the grocery store shelves every day. And every all of us will have stories about the subject matter is just really interesting. Do others have views on that? What makes IP sort of special? Yeah, to echo what Susan said, I especially working closely with the business people and getting excited about product development and seeing how it makes money for the company and you're supporting that effort. And when you go into a session and you hear people talk about something that you go and get a patent on and then see it come to life, it, it really, I mean, it's a property, right? You have to really believe in IP and the IP system and why you're protecting it. And I think litigation is so important, right? Because you, when you're protecting this asset, you know, why are we doing it? And I, I think you really have to love IP and believe in, in the technology and what, what you're protecting. I think that most of the inventors that I engage with are really, really smart people. They're really good at what they do. And uh, they're generally highly educated people with a lot of work experience that enjoy their work. And it's a pleasure to work with them because you're, you're, you're trying to protect this. It's almost like a baby, right? That becomes partially yours. It's partially the vendors, partially the companies and partially yours because you're helping them get to the point where that is going to pay some dividend for their business. Um, I also think the IP field is really uh, rewarding because most of the people that I work with are intelligent, well-prepared people. Most of the people that are on the other side, if I do have some dispute, they're always well-prepared. They're always courteous, civil, well-versed uh, and prepared for, for the matter. And I think overall, like the courts respect IP attorneys, um, a lot because I think they want to see people having that level of professionalism and preparation in all cases that come before them. And that's been my experience. And I think that's really rewarding. And I think you would probably be rewarded uh, with that experience as well if you went into the IP field. Rita, did you have thoughts to add? Yeah, uh, actually, I love what Bonnie um, said about being um, seeing the life cycle of a product um, from its beginning, inception, idea phase to um, from the trademark end, you know, coming up with a packaging and the taglines and the name, um, and then, you know, being a part of the uh, uh, clearance process for clearing a particular um, name or tagline, and then looking at jur jurisdictions, where are you going to sell this product? So being involved on the business side of things is exciting. You're really, you're f forming a partnership with your client and business. Um, and, and, um, and then moving along uh, 
having, I think having a litigation experience and practicing in litigation um, helps to frame uh, and help you um, maximize strategy and prosecution. Because you can see at the other end, how are you going to enforce this trademark? And what scope of protection, you know, is desirable for it? And um, those two experiences, I think, marry very well together to elevate your skills in both of those areas. I would add a, a few bits of this is that in most areas of law, you know, I don't know if you guys have experienced this when you work on some pro bono matters, that it's just um, you're seeing the worst of society when you're dealing with most other matters. And when you're doing intellectual property, you're often seeing the best of society. You're seeing people that are trying to create new things that are trying to advance technology. And you're often, um, you know, regardless of which side you're on, you're either helping somebody to uh, get protection for technology, or you're trying to commercialize a new innovation without somebody trying to stop you from doing that. There's, you know, bo both sides of that. You always feel like you're sort of in the right. And I think that's why in intellectual property cases, you do get a, a level of professionalism because everybody understands that everybody is there with the best intentions and um, trying to develop and make new things and create new things. So it's something that you don't get in a lot of other areas of practice. And I think that, I don't know why it is, but I do find that in court, um, oftentimes the patent attorneys and the trademark attorneys are the ones that are coming there with the most professionalism and the most skill relative to the other folks that are in court. And I don't really know why that is, but it just seems to be the way that it plays out. I've seen time and time again where judges will say, I'm so thankful to have a patent case right now because I've, I've got litigants that are going to be following the rules of discovery and, um, and being uh, respectful to each other. So I think that's a, that's a big benefit that I've seen at least. So you guys are seem pretty happy with the paths that you've chosen. Do you think that there was anything um, where maybe you would have gone down a different path? If you had known uh, more about some interest area, you know, why, uh, why do you think you landed in this exact uh, spot where you are now? Was it happenstance? Was it, do you really kind of worked for that position? Why did you land there? So I can start. I'm thrilled that I ended up where I ended up. But um, I would say that if I had, it, it, looking at it by hindsight, I wish I had been more proactive about the way that I guided my career. I feel like I, the first 10 or 12 years of my practice, I showed up to work every day and I was like, this is great. I'm so excited for what I'm doing. And I threw myself into it and I never thought about like, okay, so, you know, I'm a young associate, I'm researching and writing briefs, I'm doing document review, but what's the next step? And so then, you know, I progressed along and, you know, I sort of had this epiphany around eighth or ninth year where I thought, you know what, I'm on a track to become a first chair trial lawyer. And that's really not what I want to do. I love the litigation. I love writing briefs. I love picking apart arguments, but I, you know, I would say I didn't I didn't want to drive the bus. I wanted to be part of the team that helps get the bus where it's going, but I didn't want to be the leader. And I was able to then pivot a little bit and Jones Day found a spot for me at, and I can continue to do what I love to do and in, in not in a first chair role. But there was no guarantee that that was going to work out. And And I think that um, had I been more proactive, there might have been other decision points along the way that I could have and maybe should have explored. Um, I have no regrets, but I, I whenever I talk to folks about um, what you're thinking about as far as your career path goes, I think it's really important to periodically, whether that's monthly, quarterly, yearly, every five years, but just really reassess and where am I at? What path am I on right now? And is that really a where I want to go? And if it isn't, then make the adjustments to get yourself where you do want to go. Because there's no shame in saying, you know, I thought I wanted to do X, but I don't. And so, you know, don't continue down that path when the epiphany hits you that this isn't for me anymore, or I was misunderstanding what the, what was involved and, and make the appropriate adjustments. Because, you know, as a 10th or 11th, 12th year associate at a large law firm, 
you're not well positioned to go in house. You know, maybe you know you're much better positioned as a mid to more senior level associate, but you kind of get past that point, you know. And so that really took that possibility off the table for me because I wasn't as self aware as I should have been. I don't think I was self aware at all when I was younger. Um, when I graduated from Hiram, I was at Case uh, working in a lab doing transplant research and going to grad school there in biochem thinking about what i wanted to do do i want to be in the lab for the rest of my life and it was over a holiday that my cousin's husband who was a personal injury attorney in lake county said hey man you should go to law school and be a patent attorney you got a science degree and i said what is that and so i started looking into it and um sat for the lsat and and got accepted to two schools and decided to come here. And I, I don't regret it at all because I think I wouldn't have enjoyed being in the lab all day, although I respect them. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what they do because they're brilliant. It's just, I couldn't be in that, in that area. Um, when I first started out, I was doing prosecution and uh, mainly, and I said, well, you know, I want to be a patent litigator. And so I started cozying up to a couple of the partners and at the Renner Kenner firm that were doing exclusively litigation. And it, it was exhilarating um, because it's fast paced. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you're in court. You're making arguments. Uh, you're deposing people. You're defending depositions. But there's also a lot of travel involved and a lot of sleeping in hotels and probably not eating as best as you want and a lot of stress and pressure. And so I quickly said, OK, I, I like I like it, but I don't think I personally could keep up that pace. So I said, so I'm going to kind of go back to prosecution where I can still be stimulated with the science and the law, but not have the grind uh, of litigation. But I do, I think Rita, you mentioned having a little bit of a litigation background helps you in prosecution. I totally, totally agree because unless you're looking at a defense team tearing apart a patent from every single angle, you really don't know how to write patent applications because you have to take that specific knowledge that you learn and say, okay, when I'm writing a patent, how is that defense team three, five, 10 years from now going to start ripping this apart? And so I found the, you know, the five to 10 cases that I worked on earlier in my career were invaluable um, for what I do now. Um, I would echo, um, you know, what, Sue's, what Sue said about um, being aware, being cognizant of what you personally would like to do and following your gut, your heart. Um, if you, if you, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you want to be happy <laughs> with what you're doing as well. It's going to be hard to go to work every day um, for the rest of your life if you're not going to be happy. So definitely listen to yourself and take opportunities um, that present themselves um, to themselves to you. Um, I did that as well. Um, I started off as uh, similar to Sal um, in the lab, and um, I just decided I was getting sick actually in the lab, and um, the the smell in there and working in a factory, I couldn't I couldn't see myself doing that. So um, in switching from that career into law school, similarly, a family friend was like so-and-so did you know so-and-so was a patent attorney it's like oh what is that <laughs> so i talked to them um and then uh funnily enough they actually discouraged me from going in the field which we're doing the exact opposite of over here um but thank goodness i didn't listen to them and i went to law school and um found a clerkship right away in patent law um and you know, the the fun thing about patent law is just because you have a scientific background in a particular area doesn't mean you can't write patent applications in other areas, in other scientific areas. You can, as long as you have that registration number, which comes with any kind of science background. Um, so that's also fun to know. Um, and then... Uh, just over time, um, I got exposed to trademarks there. One of the 
partners in the firm, I think, had left. And then a lot of the portfolio, they were looking for somebody to work on. And being a younger associate, I think it just kind of fell in my lap. So, you know, on one end, I was like feeling I couldn't say no. Because <laughs> you're a younger associate, and you have to say yes. Oh, but um, but I loved it. I embraced that opportunity again, and I loved it. And I continued to work into it. Um, and then uh, at one point, I went from that small IP um, firm to a general practice firm in town, including an IP department. That firm was larger, so their um, client base seemed. Um, I don't, I don't want, uh, but more sophisticated. So like the, um, the issues that I would encounter was, was more well-rounded. I was involved in more um, M&A transactional um, due diligence matters. I've never done that before at that other small uh, firm. I was also brought into litigation there. I, I didn't do that at the previous firm. So um you know, opposition work, um, uh, agreement work. I was looking at um, portions of IP, you know, provisions in agreements, licensing um, agreements. So I think there, I just gained a whole broad, you know, broadened my skill set at a larger um, firm, eventually going back to that um, smaller boutique and bringing that skill set with me, being able to expand the practice because of that. Um, so each step in my career, I think I've been able to grow by embracing those different um, opportunities and then deciding, you know, is this where I want to be? Is is this what I want to do? And is it here or is it that at another place? Um, because you can practice your area of law in different environments, whether it's in house, <laughs> um, at a small boutique firm, um, or at a larger um, general practice firm. And you know that's personal preference to you. But to, I would I would just my advice would be just listen to your to yourself, and um, a lot of it's. Uh, faith and and fate and um, luck as well and uh, and so that's what that's what I would I would like to pass along. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add. I echo what they say. I think it's okay for your dreams to change. So I, like I said, I was in private practice. I actually made partner at my firm and I thought that was my dream, right? Is you work and work and um, you make partner and it was great. And I did it for a year and I just, I wanted something different. I, and I, you know, I remember telling my managing partner at the time that I was leaving and he just was shocked. He was, he was like, why you have all the, you have a lot of clients, you know, you're, you have such a bright future here. And it's just, it's okay. If other people don't understand why you want to change your, your, your dreams. So that's the only thing I would add. I'll ask one last question before opening it up um, for student questions, but for students that are interested in, in, starting to explore what aspects of intellectual property they're interested in, or perhaps if they are interested in intellectual property, uh, what can they do? Are there opportunities when, you know, you're a summer associate at a law firm? Are there other ways in which students can kind of explore what areas of practice they might want to focus on? What are some of the best ways that students could start to explore intellectual property law? Um, I'm, I believe that uh, if there is a clinic, some some kind of IP clinic available at your law school, you could take advantage of that. If there's an IP um, club or association, you could take advantage of that. Um, locally here in Cleveland, there's the Cleveland Intellectual Property Law Association, which is an association of IP attorneys that students can join. Uh, it's open for membership. Um, and you can attend those functions, listen to speakers in the area, and it's a good networking opportunity for you to meet um, 
attorneys that are both in-house and in law firms for potential um, networking and employment opportunities. Yeah, I, I think CIPLA is a good opportunity for all of you. Um, I believe they have a website. I don't know what it is, but CIPLA.org. So they post when their meetings are. You can go to their meetings. And I remember in 1997, I just showed up at one of the meetings. It was downtown here at the Ritz-Carlton or something. And I walked in. I looked, of course, like ignorant and like a neophyte. And then like, you know what am I doing here? Who do I talk to? And I just went and sat at a table with some lawyerly looking people and introduced myself. And then they went around the room and this guy stood up and he said, hi, this is Sal Sadoti. He's a first year law student at Cleveland State University. Um, his degrees are in bio and chemistry. If you want to talk to him, come visit him during happy hour, whatever. And so I was like sweating bullets, but it was a great opportunity just to, to, to get involved and to meet some people. And I still have some of those relationships with people I met in those very first meetings. Um, I also think there's a student membership for AIPLA, which is the American Intellectual Property Law Association. I call it the patent law fraternity. I guess if you're a patent and trademark attorney, you belong to AIPLA. And the organization is run really by its members, right? So there's committees in trademark law, trademark litigation, patent prosecution, in-house, amicus committee. And you could join, and because of technology, you know, WebEx or Zoom or whatever, they have these meetings that you could attend by those web conferences. But the point that I like to emphasize there is you're going to get out of it what you put into it. If you're just kind of kind of go and be passive, um, then you're not going to get much out of it. But if you join like the amicus committee, Someone might say, hey, I need somebody to research this, you know, whether, you know, a patent exhaustion issue in the litigation. And you might just say, well, well I got some time on my hand. I'll, I'll do that. And maybe you can do it. And they'll, they'll ask for a brief or a memo or something from you. And you'd have that relationship going and that experience going. So I would take advantage of, of those. And um, on the patent prosecution side, if that's what you're interested in, and you want to have that patent bar exam, that registration number, I took it while I was in law school. So my second year I took it, so I was already working at the Renner firm as a patent agent, which allows you to write patent applications, file them, and prosecute them. And so I didn't see myself like getting back on the horse to take the patent bar after the state bar exam. And so having that patent bar exam when you're reaching out to firms they say well this person's already those they have some modicum of understanding of patents patent law patent regulations and how to do what we do so maybe let's take a look at them and you just never know so that's something to consider as well i totally agree about your point if you're going to take the patent bar get it done because it's really easy to just i'll do it next year i'll do it next year and then next year never comes and I think, and the, the question about like, what can you do as a summer associate? I would say, you know, if you are at a firm over the summer that has any kind of intellectual property practice, go meet those folks, raise your hand. I'd love to do a project with you. You know, what can I do to help you? And check back. And then once you get the opportunity to do the project, give it 110%. I just, I think emphasizing when you're in law school, just make your studies the utmost priority when you're doing work over the summer for law firms, whatever, you know, get the job done. And then what can you do to even bump it up another notch? And that effort will just make all the difference in the world. And seeing mo that kind of motivation, people want to come back to you. You know, if you do a job and do it right and do it timely, that's the person I want to work with, you know, so, and you'll, you'll find that's, I think that's a lot of the path to success. You do a great job. You get that choice of what you want to work on. Bonnie, do you have any thoughts? I like going last because they say everything <laughs> that I would say. Um, the only thing that I would add would be um, find one or two older attorneys and make them be your mentor. Like may, it has to be somebody that you click well with, that you can be honest with and talk about whatever question you may have. I mean, it may be someone that opens a job opportunity door for you, but just find trusted people that are going to be that you can be honest with about your career choices and hold on to them for dear life. <laughs> All right, well, let's open the floor to student questions for any of our panelists. 
Uh, does anyone have one? Why don't you um, come up here so that we can hear you on the mic if you can, or do you want me to just pass one over to you? Okay, yeah, come on up. Hi, everybody, and thank you all for being here. Um, my question, well, first, I want to say I think it's really cool that some of you fell into IP law almost by accident, and then somewhere down the line, it would, like, as luck would have it, you had the perfect background. I, I don't have the perfect background. I have uh, a humanities degree from John Carroll, and that was partially because I wanted to stay as far away as possible from biology, chemistry, and engineering and stuff. But IP law interests me because, uh, Professor, what you were saying, that it seems to be the best of people trying to bring new things to light as opposed to like the worst of people fighting battles that a lot of lawyers have to deal with. Um, my question I hope is simple enough. Is there room for somebody without a biology, chemistry, or hard science background? I know this is one of your questions, but I'd like reassurance. Or if the answer is no, I'd like a very unequivocal no. Um, if there's a place for somebody with a humanities degree in what you do, the sort of things that you do. Thanks for letting me stand up here. Um, I think there is, especially in today's world, um, in, in the trademark area um, and in litigation, trademark litigation, copyright litigation, and copyright uh, law as well. Being humanities, you might have, um, you know, a, re a relatable background to copyright. Um, and so uh, definitely is room, I think, um, in, uh, in firms today and in companies today for somebody without a scientific hard science um, background to, to get in that career. If you would have asked me that 20 years ago, um, I would say that it would be hard to break into um, uh, the IP field without a hard science background. It, it's just harder at that point <clears throat> because a lot of IP um, boutique firms especially uh, existed a lot more existed back then. And um, the thought process was, well, if we hire someone with a hard science background, then they could do both patent and trademark and copyright work. But if we hired somebody without that, we, they couldn't help us on the patent side. So the tendency back then was to was to really put emphasis on having a hard science background. I think that's gone away a lot over the years, especially as practices have evolved and groups have a, a formed in even boutique firms um, that specialize in a particular area. Um, and I think you would probably have better, even better luck in a general practice firm. I wonder what my panelists uh, think of that. So I agree. I think you guys will correct me if I'm wrong. The last I knew to sit for the patent bar, you have to have the science degree. So I think prosecution and being a lead in PTAB proceedings will give you the unequivocal no. You need the hard sciences for those that aspect. But you know, certainly trademark and copyright litigation, absolutely. And even patent litigation. But I think it's I think that the common thread there is litigation. And so I would say if you think you want to do it to make yourself stand out, since you don't have the technical degree, um, I would focus on your litigation skills. So to the extent that you still have that opportunity, any kind of mock court or anything, trial advocacy courses, that kind of things, and to be able to put yourself out there as as a really solid litigator and then try to direct your career into the intellectual property field. And I will say just anecdotally, the head of our group for 15 years at John's Day was an English major. And he used to joke that he was a single E instead of a double E. Yeah, the same thing at, at Kirkland, the head of the group was an English major too. So it's, it's quite possible, especially if you're interested in litigation. Um, and it sounds like that might be something of interest to you. That's uh, perfectly normal. I'd say it was about 50-50 at Kirkland about who was a science major and not a science major in the litigation group. Uh, any other student questions? Anyone else? Go ahead. 
Could you just touch on the work-life balance as an IP attorney? Well, I'm in house, so the work life balance is great. Um, I it's a, being in house. The, the difference is right is my clients they work nine to five. So when they're on vacation, I'm not working because they're not asking me questions. Where when, in private practice, it's it's a little a little different. Um, but I I do want to emphasize though. I think you still work. You're going to, depending on what your goals are, you're going to work hard no matter where you are. So like if I want to go and be a, like a VP at my company, I'm still going to have to work hard. Um, so I do want to say that. Um, Work-life balance is something you have to work at um, to keep the balance. Um, I think you have to uh, watch your workload. Um, what you don't want to do is um, burn out uh, because then, you know, that doesn't do a good service to yourself or your clients or your employer. Um, so keeping a work-life balance is important. That's personal to you. How much can you handle? How much stress can you handle? Um, as a partner, you know, you you want to be sure that you have enough support around you um, and spread spread work around. And um, it will it's something that you need to monitor, but it's it's manageable. Definitely. I agree. And it's very manageable and very personal, personal. Um, I think that sometimes it's about establishing expectations for yourself and establishing expectations with your clients. Um, knowing, you know, conveying to them their work is important, it's on the top of your mind, but you're also a human being and not everything is a three alarm or five alarm fire every single day. And so if you have good lines of communications with your clients and you have a good staff, support staff around you and you're able to manage your schedule or what I call my docket, with all those dates, you have a very good work-life balance. And I, I say that even saying I can work 365, right? It's just about management and expectations and, and sticking to them. And I think those are, are skills that, you're, you're, that you have to work on all the time because you can find yourself going down an abyss if, if, if you don't, because you just get caught up in working and wanting to please every client all the time faster than they need to be pleased, right? Um, you don't have to get that answer every day right at the same moment. Um, so uh, work on it and um, because you're gonna perform better when you're not burned out. You're gonna perform, you're gonna have a clearer mind. You're gonna be, when you're happier in your personal life, you're gonna be probably more productive at work. So I'm not gonna disagree, but I'm gonna give you a couple of different perspectives and just take the comments you just heard and realize this is a panel of very senior lawyers. And as a young lawyer, you may not have the ability to just say, no, I'd rather not. Um, particularly if you make the career choice to go with a very large law firm. And I'm not trying to sour you on that path. I love it. I've been with the firm, if you count my staff days, since 1988, you know, 35 plus years. And I love every day of going to work. Um, I would say in my particular situation, my work-life balance is when I work, I work. And sometimes I get to have a life. And I don't mean to sound sarcastic about that. Um, but when we're getting ready for trial or when we're at trial, you know, there will be days where I can maybe text my family or talk for a very brief moment. But, you know, I'm not going to be able to have a leisurely chat and I'm not going to be able to go do things as freely as if I didn't have a job at all. Um, but there are times the court schedule, you know, case will settle, you'll get to, you know, you see holes in the schedule and then that's when I take the time. And so with the time, you know, I have no qualms whatsoever. If I have nothing to do on a Thursday afternoon in February, I'm not going to sit in my office. I'm going to go do something that works for me. So, um, and even from the very youngest years in a law firm, you have that kind of flexibility. We expect you that you're adults and we expect you to control your schedule and meet your deadlines. But um, I, I think just to be realistic, particularly the years when you're developing a practice, 
it's it's nice to have the aspirational goal of trying not to burn out and trying to manage your schedule. But the reality is, is it's demanding. We're going to work hard. And, um, you know, and if you do that work and develop that career, you will get to the point where you're able to manage your schedule much more and and to be able to you know, control things a little bit more. And I think a lot of this is firm dependent, practice dependent, specifically who you work with at the firm. Um, I'd say if work-life balance is important to you and you wanted to go into something like litigation, you have to be really, really uh, diligent in order to get that. And, um, the you know, in, in prosecution and I think in-house roles, you don't have the same kind of thing where you're going to have somebody say, I need you to get me this thing at 2 a.m. But if you're in a big law firm and you're working on a fast-paced ITC matter, you will have clients say, you have to get me this thing at 2 a.m. You know, I used to sleep with my phone, wake up when the I had a special paying for the client. And if the client emailed me at 2 a.m., I would wake up and I would do it because they were in Asia and they needed it by the end of the day. So you are, if you're, if you're going to choose a practice area where you're going to be working on a fast paced bet the company litigation with an Asian client, you have to anticipate that that's going to be your life um, for a while. Um, now you might be able to work with an attorney, more senior attorney that's helping you to guard your time, but they're often doing that by saying, I'll take the 2am email, you can sleep. So you have to work with somebody that's you know, are they the ones that's, that are going to take that for you or are you going to do that? So it's about who you pick to work with. Sometimes you don't always get to pick that. But in the early days, when you have that kind of case, that means you get a lot more experience. You're going to be the one that goes on the deposition if you're the one that the client is going to be sending that 2 a.m. email to. You're the one that's going to be able to work with the expert. You're the one that's going to go prep the client for that meeting. So it's it's a choice of how much responsibility you want and how fast paced you want your work to be versus what you want your work life to be. All right, so I think that's a good place to um, to close out and go have lunch, but we can keep asking folks questions while we go grab some food. All right, thanks. Thank you guys so much, that was really helpful.